And thank you, Rod and Marlo, uh, for that special music. We uh, seek with our music to honor the Lord. That's the audience of one, what pleases him. And uh, that is our focus, to worship and not to entertain. So thank you for your part in the worship this morning. Uh, it's neat to see the, uh, the way the group works together, our musical team. We have Brendan Dorsing kind of coordinating the music efforts. Uh, Rod, who just sang, uh, Class of 76, greatest class ever in the history of America. Class of 76 uh, is acting as our choir director. And then uh, Phil Bender uh, volunteered to work with the orchestra. Uh, Nathan Stedman to work with the congregational aspect of the singing. And uh, you see just a lot of people involved in all the different instruments and all the rotations going on here. And uh, that takes a lot of work to, to relationally do all that. And then just the logistics of all of that. And then to do it in a way that honors the Lord. So I really appreciate all the folks and their efforts in the music ministries. Uh, thank you for your part. Uh, there's always a place for others. If you have a musical talent that God's given you, uh, please uh, talk with Brother Dorsling or Brother Nathan. And uh, we would certainly... Uh, uh, use your gifts for the glory of God, so please connect with them. Uh, for our high school graduates, congratulations. That's exciting uh, to come to that time of life where you finish that first academic step, that big educational step. Uh, each of our students there are going on to college. Uh, college is not for everyone, but each of those students believe it is for them in their lives, and we are so thankful uh, for the steps that they are, they are taking. So pray for them. For those who are graduating from college, we have a number of students, which we'll highlight later. Um, for those students who are back, we are doing a cookout tomorrow at the church at 6.30. So if you were not here yet and, um, and you haven't been caught up in that loop, we invite you to join us here at church uh, tomorrow night. And we do have several graduates, and I know several students back with us. We're thrilled to have you. We, we always uh, are glad you're going to college, getting further education, but we are thrilled to have you back in the services. We're going to look here at uh, Matthew chapter 5 in just a moment, uh, but it was brought to my attention just a minute ago that Michael Parker had an incident at work. Uh, there was an explosion and a, a subsequent fire. Uh, he was um, injured, uh, minor injuries. Uh, thankfully, it could have been much worse apparently than what it was, but still we want to pray for, the, um, for Michael Parker and his family. And there was another person involved in the explosion, so we want to include that person in prayer here this morning. And uh, I know there's many, many needs that we all have, so I'll certainly be aware of them and pray for one another. So let's pray, and then we'll dive into our, our passage this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to, to study, to, to dive into this uh, incredible sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And Lord, uh, no one's ever preached a message before that or since with such depth and such scope of topics and such cohesiveness, such conviction. Uh, what an amazing sermon, uh, one that was preached in one setting. And uh, for us, it will take us all summer just to uh, touch the tip of the iceberg on each of the passages. So we thank you, Lord, for your word, how beautiful it is. We thank you for the living word, the Lord Jesus, who obeyed it, fulfilled the law, fulfilled every aspect of prophecy, and indeed uh, demonstrated that he was uh, the, the perfect sacrifice. And we thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for his resurrection. Lord, for this morning, as we come to worship you, we pray that this time of our worship, the, the preaching and receiving of your word, that we would be attentive, that the Spirit of God would speak to our hearts, uh, the topic this morning is extremely uh, pertinent. We pray that we would grow in our, our own growth as believers, that we would be people who would, uh, would not have unrighteous anger, that we would not have certainly anger without a cause towards anyone. And so we pray for our own development of grace. And we ask for grace. We pray, Lord, for the many needs of our church family. They're, they're great. In this recent incident here of Michael Parker, we pray for his healing. We pray for his co-labor likewise, that there would be healing there and grace. And thank you that you preserved their life. It sounds like it could have been far worse. And so we're thankful for your, your preservation and grace there. Now, as we look into your word, uh, we, we know that you look into our hearts. And uh, we may put on a good smile. We may play a good game outwardly. But ultimately, uh, you look way beyond what man can see. You look to the heart of man. 
And I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be right before you this morning, that we'd have right relationships with others as, as much as lies in us. So, Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at the theme of fulfilled in each of these messages. And so sometimes you get to a paragraph that it's not a prophetic passage as this one, uh, yet there's a fulfillment theme. And the fulfillment theme of this paragraph is uh, if you have a heart of anger, an unrighteous heart of anger, under the right provocation and circumstances, it can lead to murder and uh, fulfill the act of the violation of the Sixth Commandment. And so our message this morning is murder fulfills ultimately the heart of anger. That's pretty serious stuff. So let, let's dive into uh, this, this theme a little bit here this morning. Uh, I think, unfortunately, it's way, way too um, pertinent. Uh, the phrase I'm drawing out for our theme for the text is that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, that person uh, ultimately fulfills the heart of a murderer, is, is the heart of a murderer. And you think about uh, America. We're on the 127th day of 2023, and we in America have already had 199 mass shootings. That's overwhelming. It's more than one a day. Uh, we had our last Bible study at the Mines on Friday. Uh, great time, a blessing all semester. And then uh, afterwards we went down to, uh, I think it's Anthony's Pizzeria there in Golden. Wonderful pizza. And uh, we were outside sitting and just talking and, and eating probably more than we should have. Um, but one of the students, his name is Zane, mine student, uh, he's from a, a, a town in, in, in Texas. It's, his town is Allen, Texas. And he was sharing how he went to Allen, Texas and played football there in their amazing program and talked about uh, the growth and illustrated in many ways the wealth of, of Allen, Texas. We just talked about that Friday night. So Lisa and I, we, we came home last night. We, we turned the TV on for the news just briefly. And um, here is a shooting in Allen, Texas. Uh, I immediately sent a, a text message to Zane saying that as far as you know, uh, is your family okay? That's his town, that mall he has shopped in. That's his backyard. And he said, yeah, our, fam our family's fine. Thanks for your, your concern. But here, a another shooting uh, is yet to be determined after the issues of those who are in the hospital, how many, will, will, how many deaths there will be. But already we know that there's a handful, and that's sad. One is too many. And uh, here is uh, someone murdered just ruthlessly, unnecessarily, foolishly evil uh, people there in Allen, Texas. In the last 75 years, we've had so many shootings. Uh, the top 30 I could list, I'll just highlight a couple. The worst mass shooting was in Las Vegas a few years ago. 60 plus a perpetrator were killed. We come to uh, the second most, the largest fatality in a mass shooting, the Orlando nightclub shooting, 49, plus the perpetrator. Uh, several, several of these mass shootings took place on college campuses, one at Virginia Tech, 32, plus the perpetrator, 33 fatalities. Some of these shootings take place at schools, how tragic, Sandy Hook Elementary School, 27, plus the perpetrator. Just recently, a Christian school, and you know, a number of people killed, not the same numbers, but again, one is too many. Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, 17 plus the perpetrator. In our state, in the top 30, we have three in that category. Number 14 in all-time mass shootings, Columbine, 13 plus two perpetrators. Number 18, the Aurora Theater shooting, 12 killed. Number 28 in the top 30, the Boulder shooting of 10 killed. So as you, you hear these numbers, that's a lot of murders. That's a lot of deaths, just a, a brief sampling. And uh, you, you have to ask the question, is there any common denominator to these just wicked, wicked acts? Is there any common denominator? And uh, we're going to look at a passage that gives you at least a starting point on the topic. Uh, if you talk to the, to the police personnel and the detectives, and they describe homicidal rage. They'll say that often these murders are prompted by jealousy, revenge, greed, lust, whatever. 
but they almost all you, you just comprehensively say at the root of all of these murders is typically a strained relationship or additionally strained relationships and a heart of anger. In fact, uh, the definition of homicidal rage is unreasonable anger that makes an individual capable of committing the unlawful killing of another human being. So uh, we're talking about the heart of a murderer this morning and in this passage in Matthew chapter 5. Now unfortunately there's been a long history of murder in this fallen world. Imagine the first siblings, you know, Cain, Abel, brothers, brothers, you know, just a few years off of the act of God's direct creation of everything. Uh, just amazing. And, and yet, in the very beginning, we have, a, we have a murder. And that murder picture that's described in Genesis is really, uh, is really the platform for all follow-up murders. They're all very similar. There's some common denominators. So uh, it's interesting that the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to these religious leaders. And what he calls them, he says, Ye are of your father, the devil. That's really as harsh, as harsh a language as you could ever express. Your father's the devil, you know, your spiritual father. And the lust, the desires, the passions of your father, you will do. And they describe Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning. So when you have a, a murderer, and we go all the way back to Cain, although Satan is not directly described in that, in that setting, he's influencing the thoughts. He is shaping a direction. He's suggesting things. And the devil doesn't make you kill someone, uh, but certainly he is trying to influence you to go in that direction, whether to kill yourself or to kill another. And uh, it's when you literally pull the trigger to that temptation, then people fall. And so Satan is the ultimate murderer right from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. So the ultimate liar and murderer is Satan. So if there's a crime scene where someone died in a, in a murder, I always just drop back for a moment and say, okay, this is tragic, but I have a feeling if we study it more carefully, you're going to see Satan involved. You're going to see that, that, that mind of Satan tempting that individual and usually trying to create and feed a heart where the heart gets angry. And that heart evolves from anger to, to, to hatred to bitterness and then if opportunity arises to vent it in, in an act called murder. And so usually in a murder setting, usually Satan's involved. Notice in Genesis 4 verse 5, there's the context of the first murder scene, first crime scene. Genesis 4.4 4 says, And Abel, he also brought the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So, so God made it very clear to this family, to these brothers, that if you want to come to God and you want your offering to be accepted, it had to be a, a, an innocent animal that was sacrificed. And the message was clear. The only way to approach God was through the, through the death of an animal in this case, foreshadowing the future death of Christ. The only way to approach God is through a sacrifice was the message. And Abel got it right, and God was pleased, and Abel's worship was accepted. Cain knew the standard and said, I'm, I'm not going to follow the standard. I'm going to do it my way. And if, if you could do me a favor, please, if, if you have a funeral, please you, you think for your songs. Think for your songs. Okay, think for your songs. So, so Abel says, I'm going to do it my way. And my way is I'm going to be a farmer and I'm going to grow a garden and I'll, as, a, as a result of my hard work, my toil, my moil, I'm going to take my, the fruit of the garden and I'm going to bring my efforts and produce them and pre present them to you, God. And I'm demanding, God, you accept me on the basis of my works. And God says, that's not how it works. It's for by grace are you saved. It's through the sacrifice that is the only way you can come to God. And so the way of Cain, as Jude talks about it, and first Peter, second Peter talks about it, the way of Cain is the way of trying to save yourself for your own efforts, your own initiative, your own work. And God says, that's folly. Don't even think about it. Come to me through a cross. So, so Cain is upset that his offering was not accepted, 
And the Bible says in verse 5 of Genesis 4, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain, look at the next phrase, was what? He was, he was angry. He was wroth. In fact, the text says he was very angry. He's very wroth. So when, when you see someone with this type of heart, that is the heart of a murderer. So there's a connection when you get down to, to verse 8. And Cain talked with, his, with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So right from the beginning with the first murder in the Scripture, it's saying that anger is the heart of the murderer. And it's very clearly seen in this, this narrative that I just read. That's pretty spooky. You know, there are times where we get into very difficult counseling situations where a woman might come in and she'll say, I'm, I'm just, I feel so threatened. I, I feel so fearful. Uh, there are situations I've dealt with over the years. Very common theme here. And so this is real. This is real where you feel threatened. I remember I was threatened here at church a number of years ago. Uh, there was a, a guy that was in jail for murder. He was released from murder. And he was uh, older than our college students, but he, wanted, he started to attend our Bible study up at, up at uh, the University of Colorado, up in Boulder. And the girls felt very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Uh, to the point that Pastor Ted Rich at the time had to talk with him about it, that we, our girls are feeling uncomfortable. They don't like you hitting on them. Your, your approach, your manner is just creepy. And I had to follow up and confront him as well. In fact, to the point, I don't want you around him, quite frankly. I don't think it's a good situation. You're not ready for this social interaction yet. We'll work with you because we're here to help you. But right now, this is off limits. And you can disagree or agree with my judgment on that. But that's what I should share with him. He was furious. He was angry. He posted all kinds of junk on social media. I mean, he had the heart of a murderer. He stopped coming to church. There was anger, anger, anger. And then he showed up one Sunday. Sat right about where Dennis sits. And um, I went to our security team and said, I'm, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with this guy. And uh, we had a, I had the security team put a guy literally right behind him. Literally right behind him. And I said, if he stands up with a gun, just plug him. Just, to, just neutralize, neutralize the situation. Neutralize the situation. And I didn't exactly say that, but I said, do neutralize the situation. I prefer not being killed in a service, nor any of our church people. Okay. But when people get angry, that's when you get the threats, and that's when you, you start to get feeling intimidated, and, 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 and you feel like, man, I think it, under the right circumstances, this guy or this girl could kill me. Okay. This is the story of the first murder scene. And that theme holds true through most of the history of murder. The Bible has a lot of stories of murder. There's Lamech and Pharaoh and Abimelech and Joab and David and Absalom and Jezebel, Haziel, Athaliah, and the list goes on and on of murderers. In fact, Jesus was murdered. Now, he laid down his life. He had total control of living, total control of laying down his life. But they murdered him. On the chart, they murdered him. So let's look at our text now with this question and with this context. So as you work through the Sermon on the Mount, if you can keep this in mind, this is an evangelistic sermon. This is an evangelistic sermon. So as Jesus is sitting on this mountaintop, looking down into the Sea of Galilee, and all the thousands of people are sitting out there, standing out there, congregating, his first goal is to win every single person there to himself. He wants every person there to, to be poor in spirit. He wants every person to be a beggar in spirit. He wants every person there to say, I can't save myself, I need the Lord. And I need to mourn over my sins if I'm going to find comfort and salvation with God. So this is an evangelistic message. There are those that he is going to have to deal with over and over and over again. They're going to take in the task. It's the Pharisees. They're the ones who are most studious, uh, they're the ones who claim to be the authorities. Uh, they're the ones who quote each other. They're the ones writing all the articles. They're the ones controlling most of the rabbinical schools. So it's these scribes and the Pharisees. Look at the text here in verse 20. 
For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall know in, in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He is saying to the audience, if you want to go to heaven, you have to be more righteous than the most righteous group of people in the universe. They're not saved, but if you want to be saved, you have to, be, you have to do more righteous acts. You have to be more righteous than they. So if you let that settle down, digest, if you're listening, you're saying, that's impossible. Who can be more righteous than these guys? These guys are nuts. They're fanatical on their efforts to do righteous things and keep the whatever law and ceremonies. So what we have here is now the transition to one of six corrective illustrations by Jesus where he will say, you have heard it said. And he's going to make a statement which is not a contrast between his teaching and the Old Testament, but it's a contrast between his teachings and the teachings of man. So he, Jesus, is not contradicting the Old Testament, nor is he modifying the Old Testament. He's simply saying, this emphasis you've heard from man, now I'm going to correct it. You've heard this, but I'm going to give you a bigger picture and get to the heart of the text. So this is extremely powerful what he's going to do here. So he says, you've heard, and he's going to go down this line of two illustrations, one I'll cover today and one in two weeks, that's going to illustrate the type of righteousness or the lack thereof that people have. So if you talk to the Pharisee, the big proud Pharisee, they would say, you know, I have kept the commandments from my youth. List them for me. I can check every box. Have I ever killed anyone? The sixth commandment, no, I'm not a murderer. Uh, I have not committed adultery. Uh, I have not lied. I've not stolen. I have not coveted my... I, I, I have met the law's requirements. I'm a righteous man. And back to commandment six, I certainly haven't murdered anyone. So Jesus is looking at that audience and us. And he's going to say, okay, you've not outwardly murdered anyone. Okay, that may be true, but technically... You have the heart of a murderer if you have an anger that is not righteous. And he's going to get to the heart of the word of God that it deals with the, with the heart, with the heart. So the, the Pharisees on the outside, they look like model citizens. They were wearing sheep's clothing, but inwardly they were ravening wolves. Inwardly, inwardly. And this is important for us for church people. We often convey an outward message or picture like we're, like we're above others, we're perfect, we're this and that. When in reality, if our real hearts were revealed, it would be quite interesting probably for all of us. People really knew the real you and I. So Jesus is going to expose the real you and I in this, in this section. Now, when it comes to, to the murderer's heart, I've illustrated it was like Cain. It's a, ha a ha heart that's very wrathful, very angry. Now, if someone does kill someone, the Word of God is very clear as to what the response should be. So let's just get this context before we jump into that text. In Genesis 9, verse 6, this is situated way before Exodus 20 and following with where this is legislated in Mosaic law. This is before law. It says, Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And this is the reason why. For in the image of God made he man. So what's this text saying? Before Mosaic law, he is saying if you kill someone, you murder someone, we're not talking about war, we're not talking about self-defense issues, we're talking about where you have hatred in your heart, you have anger in your heart, and you kill someone. First degree murder. He's saying if, you, if someone has done that, the right civil response to that perpetrator, that offender, is you take their life, what would, we would call the death penalty or capital punishment. So this is God is speaking. Whether you like it or agree with it or not, this is God's word. He is saying when people murder, they are basically destroying one of God's creations, an image bearer of God. So God in essence is saying, when you attack and murder the image bearer, you are attacking the creator of the image bearer, God himself. And there's a big consequence. Now there's an advantage to this, this governing principle is that serves as a deterrent. 
that serves as a deterrent. If there's a death penalty, some people will say, you know what? I don't want to be put to death. This will hold me back. This will restrain me. And the statistics are very clear that that's true. You think about Colorado, up until 2020, we had the death penalty for, for, for first-degree murder, for treason, for aggravated kidnapping, several other things. In 2020, our state said, we are going to set aside the death penalty, forget it. We're not going to use it for any offense. Murder, forget it. And we're not the only state that holds to, to that position. There are 23 states currently that do not have in law capital punishment. So that means there's 27 states that say for particular crimes, a person could be put to death for their, for their criminal action. And when you study the states, mostly red say you can put someone to death for a death penalty, and the bluer states, or blue states, mostly have a, a restriction on this. You can do the statistical analysis. And that will confirm what I'm saying is the death penalty is a restraint to more violence. And God knows that. So what we have here is Genesis 9, verse 6. And in Exodus 20, verse 13, one of the Ten Commandments, thou should not murder, is technically what's in view there. And later Moses is going to say, if you do murder someone, then the right thing under Mosaic law is to follow Genesis 9, 6. And their life should be taken. Now, what about the New Testament era, the church age? Do we, do we follow that or do we set that aside? Well, uh, you have in... In the New Testament, you have uh, Romans 13, 4, referring to government. He's the minister of God. Government serves God's purposes to do thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. So if you're a law offender, if, if you're a lawbreaker, if you're a murderer in this case, government bears not the sword in vain. What does that mean? That means that government has the authority from God to serve God's purposes by executing one who committed a capital offense crime. So Romans 13 supports Genesis 9, 6. So it's a consistent message, whether you like it or not. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay. So what we have here is, is a death penalty. Now you think about our situation. We are now facing 25,000 plus murders a year in America. So just as we sit here, as we sit here, 70 people are going to die today. As we finish this service, I'll preach probably two hours in length. For a guess, I'm teasing. But during this hour, there's going to be a person who's been murdered, and probably a second person, maybe a third. Just this hour, and every hour, and every hour, and every hour. That's not counting, that's not counting self-murder. That's, that statistic's not in that. Self-murder is called suicide. Nor is it counting pre-birth murder, which is called abortion. So since 1973, in the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade ruling, there have been 63 million abortions. That's a whole nation. Just let that sink in. This is America. This isn't a third world country that didn't have the word of God as at its foundation. This is America. 25,000 plus murders numerous self-murders and 63 plus million abortions since 1973. So do you think we need revival? Do you think we need a 10-day prayer summit? Do you think we need to be praying regularly for our country? Does it not surprise you if God judges this nation that he's perfectly just to do it? When you're murdering so many people, image bearers of God, and, and you expect not God to chase in your nation? And the Word of God tells you how he chastens. And when you study where we are now, we're in class five rapids now. We went past class four rapids. We're at the brink of God's complete judgment of America. And he'd be perfectly just to do it. We are a bloody, bloody, bloody nation. And we're becoming more violent and more bloody and more evil by the day. So we, we, the Christian... We've got to stand in the gap. We've got to get on our knees and we've got to intercede. Lord, be merciful to me and be merciful to our churches. And God, be merciful to our country. In your judgment, would you remember grace? Would you remember mercy? Because we are on, we're on a judgment path right now. And God would be perfectly just to do it. Okay. 
Now, as we get into this passage, that's some of the background to what the Pharisees would, be, would know of the Bible, what you and I would know today of the Bible. But Christ is going to go more than just the out, outside external Pharisee. He says, I've never killed anyone. I'm a really righteous man. And Jesus is going to say, you Pharisee, you are a serial killer at heart. You're a serial killer at heart. God knows the heart, 1 Kings 8, verse 39. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. What does that mean? He knows your inner thoughts. He knows your inner counsels, your motives, your imaginations, everything that goes across your brain there, every signal you've sent out, he knows it even before you thought it. He records it. He knows every detail of us. He knows the heart. Now you and I, we can judge the outward appearance. Don't judge the heart. Don't judge the heart. That's God's uh, terrain. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 tells us that. Therefore, he tells us not to judge man in his motives unless they express them. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels, the motives of the hearts. So God says, I'm the judge of the heart, and I know your hearts, every single thought. So the message that's going to come across to these Pharisees and to us by extension this morning is right external behavior only pleases God when it corresponds to right internal thoughts, attitudes, and motives. So he's speaking to an audience that outwardly their behavior, they're not killing people, they're not funerals, there's not a wake following them, but in their hearts they're serial killers. And so their inner hearts and thoughts are incongruent with their, their external righteous behavior. And God says, you have to have both parts to please me. You have to have the right heart and the right actions. And now you're on good ground. If you have the right actions and underneath nasty thoughts and hearts and intents and motives, you don't worship me and you don't please me. So this is what he's going to drive at for this passage. Now, let's look at this heart text for a moment. Verse 22. But I say unto you, you've heard of old, you've heard these things about, you know, no kill anyone. If, you, if someone does kill, they should be, you know, there should be a judgment. Death is what he's referencing there. But I'm going to say something to you about your heart. I'm going to go deeper than the external you know, confirmation or conforming to the law. I'm going to go to the heart of the issue. He says that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So this, this starts to get, real, I think, extremely convicting for all of us. All right, so you have not killed anyone yet outwardly. But today, in your heart, there's someone that you are angry with and without a cause. It's not a justified, it's not righteous anger is the point. In, in Matthew's writing this, the words of Jesus make it very clear. We're not talking about righteous anger. There's a place to get really angry over righteous things. Uh, God the Father in Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day single day and why is God the Father angry at the wicked he's angry at their wickedness and how can he love this wicked thing and also hate this wicked thing that, that's for God to figure it all out he obviously loves this world but he hates the wickedness of a perfect passion so God the Father hates righteously God the Son, when he saw how, the, how God was being worshipped in the temple, all the merchandising going on, all the nonsense, all the monkey business, he cleanses the temple twice. His disciples stand back and say, whoa, 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 we haven't seen this aspect or this attribute. He is furious. And then he realized, oh, that's true. The psalmist did say the Messiah would have a, a holy righteousness, a seal, when it comes to the, especially the worship of God. So Christ had perfect, righteous anger. So the Father has perfect, righteous anger. The Son has perfect, righteous anger. And then when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6, you have a situation where Nahash the Ammonite says, 
yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll work out a deal of you Jews. Uh, yeah, covenant, we got it. Here's the condition. I take out your right eye. So here's the condition. We'll have peace between us. On this condition, I take all your right eyes out. Would you sign up for that? So the word gets back to this carnal leader, and on one occasion he does something good, and only because God was involved in it. So the word gets to Saul, and the word of God said, the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those things, and his anger was kindled greatly and took care of, neutralized the problem. That's the Holy Spirit directing him in righteous anger. The point is, God in his essence, God in all his attributes, God, in this case, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect hatred towards evil things with a righteous anger. So there's a place for righteous anger. The problem is with righteous anger for us, if we don't handle it right, if we don't give it to God in prayer and to him who judges righteously, then that anger begins to simmer. Then it begins to morph. Then you get into resentment and bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. And now you're fitting a category here with this one. You have anger in your heart that you didn't deal with properly. And so anger is a very, very powerful motive. Anger is just one step away from the act of murder because it is the heart of the murderer. So he says here, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So the Old Testament, the, the Pharisees are saying, okay, I've never killed anyone, and if you did, boy, there's judgment, both by man and civilly and by God. And Jesus says, okay, let me tell you, if you have an anger in your heart unresolved and it's unforgiving, you're, you're in danger of the judgment because of your heart problem. So what does that mean for us? We have got to guard our hearts. This takes hard work. With all diligence, guard your hearts. Because out of that heart flow the issues of life. So if you're struggling right now and you have anger that's been building up in your heart towards someone, you're on dangerous ground. You may look like the greatest church member. You may look like the Apostle Paul. But if your heart, you're angry at someone right now, and it's simmering, and it's doing, and it's unresolved, and you hate someone in your heart, there's someone you cannot forgive in your heart, I'm, I, you're, you're a murderer. You have a murderer's heart. Your heart is no different than the person on death row. Now, his actions were different, but the heart, no difference. So this is serious stuff we're talking about. Serious. In fact, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. If there's someone in this church you hate, you despise, you can't stand, you're not on good ground. I'm not saying you're not a believer. I'm just saying you're not living like one. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So this is extremely important. To, you know, is there someone right now, right now, is there someone in your heart you are angry with? Someone in your heart that you couldn't forgive right now? This is something God wants you to deal with now. You're on very dangerous ground. Very dangerous ground. You know, the Bible says, let not the sun come down upon your wrath, Ephesians 4. That's saying, you can have righteous anger, but take the right biblical steps so you don't carry it into the next day. Let not the sun come down upon your angry heart. Get your heart right today. Resolve the issues as much as lieth in you today. Otherwise, if you don't do that, Paul says, you have given a place for the devil. And the word place there is a military term for a military base of operations. When you don't handle anger right and you don't resolve the issues and it's in your heart right now, you're wondering why you're so defeated and so discouraged and so distraught. It's because Satan is, you've given Satan an advantage in your life. He cannot obviously possess the heart of a believer, but he's influencing your heart and you're giving way to Satan and he's landing B-52 bombers. He's bringing stealth bombers into that base. He's bringing every, an arsenal on that base to destroy you. Let not the sun come down upon your wrath, lest you give place to the devil. 
the reality of the heart. Now, let's talk about how that anger might be expressed. This is not an exhaustive text, but usually it's at the, at the heart of how you would see if someone is angry. Usually out of an angry heart comes words. Some people can internalize that anger and they just destroy themselves internally, just destroy themselves. Some people allow that anger to come out and destroy others. So here's how it looks. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. So the council here is the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. That's the highest government in the land for a Jew in this, in this message, in this context of the message. And that, that group of 70 plus the high priest, that, that group, they just took the difficult cases in the land. They're not going to deal with the day-to-day -day trivial problems. They're going to deal with the big ones. Is you say, oh, this, calling someone Raka, that's not a big deal. You wouldn't take this to the Supreme Court with our nine justices. Okay. You wouldn't even think about it. And Jesus is saying, I want you to rethink about what I'm saying to you, that an angry heart is extremely dangerous because it's the heart of a murderer. And how serious is murder? Will you take out an image of God, an image bearer? So Raka, what does Raka mean? means full. It, it means empty head. Uh, we might say that person's an airhead, might be our word. Uh, I find this really, this is funny. My, I, I adore my Uncle Jim. He's 90, I think, one. He lives in Indiana. Highly educated man, highly educated man. Brilliant man, well-read, unbelievably well-read. Uh, very refined, rich heritage. But back, I think it was in the 70s, we're going back a while, there was, this, there was this TV show. I think I watched it maybe for five minutes and it was enough for me. And I'm a kind of guy who likes the Three Stooges. So you would think I would like Archie Bunker. You would think I would like that. I like the Three Stooges. That's intellectually stimulating, at least to me. I find great joy in the Stooges. But Archie would call his, his brother, his son-in-law, you know, a meatball or a meathead or a blockhead or whatever. And my Uncle Jimmy thought that was so funny. I thought it was stupid, you know. Call him a blockhead, you know, meathead. Meathead, meathead. Soraka, meathead, blockhead, airhead, empty head. You're saying, you call someone Raka? That's just a literal transliteration of the Greek word there. You call someone an airhead, and that's, that's something you would take to the Supreme Court? <laughs> really? Really? What, what are you saying when you call that person an airhead, an empty head? What are you saying about that image bearer and the creator of the image? What are you saying about that person's worth or value as an image bearer, as one who Christ died for, and one that God has a plan for if they yield to it, a purpose that brings God glory? So when we start calling a person Raka, we're atta attacking the, the creator of the image. We're, we're attacking the, the purposes of God and what he wanted to accomplish in the image. Here's how it works in the home. Is whether it's a husband or the wife, and I read this in books, I've never seen this in home where there's anger. Thank the Lord. Lightning bolts. But what happens is us men, I'll just speak us, us men, we can be angry because we were discomforted. We didn't get what we wanted. We're not talking righteous anger. We're just talking about selfish pride. We were grieved because we didn't get our way or our timing or we were in inconvenienced. And so we get angry. And then in our anger, we say things. And what are you saying when you're angry? You s typically strip your spouse of value in your statements. So the end result is your wife says, wow, he just vented. And I feel like trash. I feel like I am worthless. So if I went around and surveyed, I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't embarrass all of us here, men. But if I, if I surveyed and said, okay, what women here would say, yes, I know exactly what you're saying, my husband has or is, he gets angry, he says things, 
And they're nasty things. They're cruel things. I feel like a blockhead. I feel like an airhead. I feel like there's no value at all. I feel trashed. Is this not true, ladies? Is this not how it works, ladies? Okay, it's true. It is true. It's tragically true. Okay. So you call someone raka, you're in danger of the council. This is serious. Let's go to the next phrase. Because it's, it's, it's escalating. There's progression of thought. It's advancing. Because this, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger not of the, the earthly council of men, the Sanhedrin, but they're in danger of Gehenna, hellfire. So the first reference to hell in the New Testament comes from the lips of Jesus, and he is say, he's associating hell with a heart that is not dealing with anger properly, it is abusing someone emotionally with their words. And when you have that emotional abuse of the words, she might say, you know what, I felt when he yells at me or screams at me or says these horrible things, I almost fear that the next thing, he's, he's going to hurt me. He, he may hit me he, or he may kill me. And I won't survey that question either. How many times you said, I felt he was so angry, he was so enraged, he was so irrational that I felt like, wow, is he going to kill me? You think about the word fool here. <laughs> Have you ever been called a fool? The Greek word is moros. Our English word is moron. <laughs> I've been called a fool more than once. I'm not real proud of it. Probably the funniest time I was ever called a fool I was in 10th uh, grade uh, working um, during the summer uh, for Wolfington's International. They sold school buses, hearses, and ambulances outside of Philadelphia. And so my job was to clean school buses before they went out. They were sold. I'd clean them up, and then we would deliver them to the school districts or the hearse or the ambulance. Can you imagine me driving an ambulance? Can you imagine the fun I had driving ambulances the trouble I got in with sirens. Can you just imagine? I won't go into it. Can you imagine me driving a hearse? And it motivated me. I built a coffin in my senior year in wood class. Because I'm going to have a lot of fun in one of those hearses with my coffin. But our motto, Peter Greenleaf and I, the buses would come in the last bay on the, on the back of the building... And we just sprinkled water with the hose. We had the steam pressure to do the wheels. And our motto was, if it's wet, it's clean. And we just wet them down and drive them out. And it looked pretty good. Now, they're still dirty, but if it's wet, it's clean. But, but at work, there was a guy. His name was Nugent Strange. Little guy, maybe all of five feet, maybe. Okay, African-American, older gentleman. His job was to drive the owner of the company from Philadelphia out west 20 miles to, to, the, to, to our place of work. And there was probably reasons that this little guy drove uh, the Wolfingtons to work or home more. Uh, and it was, he drove as a chauffeur the, a Cadillac. And he got Cadillacs that looked like every year, a new Cadillac. So his only job was to drive the Wolfingtons to work and then he would go out and work on the Cadillac all day long, every day, and then drive Mr. Wolfington home after work. And he had it, he had it beautifully set up to just do the work on the, on the detail work of a, on the Cadillac. Well, in, in this building, the, the only place you can get water other than the bathrooms was a, a, a sink by, in the washing bay where I worked. So Nugent would come back five foot... Uh, he couldn't reach the gas pedal. He had a wood block on the gas pedal, okay? And he'd come, he would come with his little white rag, and he'd turn this thing on, get it wet, and he'd go back. And he always would say, Hi, Willie. Hey, Willie, how you doing, Willie? And I'd say, Hi, Nugent, how you doing, you know? And then the devil got in me one day with, with Peter. We said, Nugent comes back every day to get water out of that sink. So I said, Peter, let's load up. This, don't do this at home. We're, we're washing a 72-seat international bus. I said, let's take one of the hoses and run the hose up that exhaust pipe. It's 40, 50 feet in length. 
and just load the pipe up. Now, it gradually comes out because it's a little bit of an angle. But if you keep the pressure on, you can fill that thing up. And that's a big international motor. So I would, I would sit up there. Peter would run the water up the pipe. And I'd sit there ready to turn the ignition on when, when Willie would come by the back of the bus. So Willie would come by over the little break. <laughs> and, and I would turn that thing when Peter said, now. And I'd turn that ignition switch. And it was a bazooka gun. <laughs> I mean, water just blow poor Nugent into the next county. You only did that once. I've never seen a man angrier. <laughs> And he chased me around the building with that little white rag. <laughs> and the whole time, Willie, you are a fool! A fool, Willie! <laughs> the whole time. So when I think of fool, I think of me. <laughs> I think of Willie. But maybe you think of yourself. What is a fool? A fool is a fool. And the person who calls someone a fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now you stop for a moment, you're saying, okay, let me get this right. If I call my wife or my friend or whoever, Raka or a fool, that God takes this really serious. I'm going to say, yes, very serious, very serious. But you're going to say, and this is the point, you're going to say, you know what? I've said things worse than a fool or a Raka, an airhead, to my friend or spouse. Isn't that correct? I mean, your wife would say, I would, I would relish just being called a raka or a fool. But he doesn't stop there. He goes way beyond that. He attacks me. So what about that person? If the standard here is just calling someone a raka in their head or someone a fool. It's telling you how God views anger in our speech. And all of a sudden, the righteous Pharisee hearing this is saying, you know, I've not killed anyone. I'm not a murderer. And if he really now looks into his heart, he's saying, you know what? I, I, I've called people all kinds of horrible things. And I do have some anger in my heart towards someone I can't forgive. And the Lord is saying, you, my friend, are a murderer. And you have multiple people you can't forgive. Then you're a serial killer. Do you get it? So here's the remedy. Okay, here's how it works. God doesn't want us to stay there and live this way. We'll just wrap this up quickly. Here in this next text, therefore, in view of what I just said, Jesus says, if you bring your gift to the altar, so now we're, we're coming to synagogue, or in this case the temple, you're coming to the temple to worship, and the subjunctive mode, so if, if you're there, here, here's how it's work. you're bringing your little sheep with you on a leash, without spot or blemish, and you're bringing your little you know, sheep with you, and you come up to the, 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 the wall, where on the other side of the wall is the courtyard of the priests, which is where the altar is going to be, where they're going to take your gift and sacrifice it. So you come up there of your gift, you have, leading that little animal along, along, and you come up in your worship. You know that you're not right with God. You want to get things right outwardly to obey the law. So you, you take that animal and you put your hands on its head before you give it to the priest. And that action, you're saying, I'm taking my sin and guilt, and I want it transferred to this innocent animal as my substitute. And then take this innocent substitute, and now, Mr. Priest, go and sacrifice it. And I know if you do that, I'll be right with God. It's what I need to do to get back with God. And the Lord says, okay, you've come to the altar. You've come to make your, your worshiping God of your sacrifice. He says, however, when you're coming, you remember, it comes to your mind that there's someone that has something ought against you. It means something against you. You're there ready to worship, and all of a sudden you're reminded, there's something, someone has an offense. I've offended someone. And at this point, you remember it. God then says, in four commands, so this is the stress of the paragraph from, from a language viewpoint, if you, in your mind, remember someone has something against you, you may be creating in their heart a culture where they could get angry and have the heart of a murderer. You, you have offended them. Maybe you've said something. You know, if you've trashed your spouse or your friend, you've said unbecoming and unfitting and inappropriate words, it is your responsibility at some point and readily and quickly to go to your spouse and say, look, I am sorry. 
forgive me, forgive me. I was wrong. What I said was just being mean. I didn't mean what I said anyway. I was just venting. And I just crushed you. And I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? Now that person's in a tough spot. They're in a tough spot. What do they do? Okay, I forgive you. You can do it all over again. And again, and again, and again. So, so he, you may have to go to someone today and say, would you forgive me? You know you did something wrong. You know they're upset about it. So there's two points here. You know, you, you, you've got anger you've got to deal with, but you may be creating a situation over here where they may have anger. And God is saying, I don't want anyone to have anger in their heart. So first, he says here, leave, leave your gift, take your little animal, give, tie, tie that little lamb up, that leash and a little pole there, and you can come back, we'll take care of your animal. Priest, we got plenty of priests here, they'll take care. You leave your gift right here, and go, I'm commanding you, go your way, go out to the highway, to the road, and here's your priority. First, be reconciled to your brother. So find the person you know has something against you, make a beeline to that person, confess your sin to them, agree that you did wrong, and by the grace of God, seek God to help you change it so you don't repeat it. Get it right. If there's reparation, make reparation. Whatever you need to do, make it right. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and then worship. And the point God is saying here, if, if you have not done your part in reconciliation of relationships, you're not right with God. That's the message. If you're not right with your brother and you have not taken efforts to make it right, you're not right with God. If we have not taken these actions to make things right, God is saying, I'm not interested in your worship. You're not ready to worship. You got a problem here you need to resolve. So first be reconciled to your brother. Then after you get it right, then come back. Well, what happens if they don't want to get reconciled? Well, that's, that's their side of the equation. You did your part. As much as lieth in you, you take these steps, try to win them back. They don't want to forgive or whatever. That's their choice. We're going to pray that they'll get things, you know, be willing to forgive you in due time. But right now, you know, you, you fulfill your responsibilities. And then he says this, and we conclude. Agree with your adversary quickly. Now, he's describing the person has something against you. You just thought, you came to worship, you just realized, wow, that person, I really messed, I really, I really fell, I really messed up. So, <laughs> When you realize that, he is saying in that context, make a beeline, beeline, don't wait till next month. This isn't next year. This is now time. Quickly, go to your adversary. The person has something against you while you're in the way with him. Settle the problem outside of court, <laughs> you know, is the idea. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. And then he concludes... Verily I say unto you, the person who's offended someone, go, get it right, be reconciled. For verily I say unto you, if you don't do that, you shall by no means come out thence. You're not going to come out of the prison till you have paid the uttermost farthing. farthing small Roman coin, penny. He's saying to avoid judgment and the need to pay to the penny, to avoid exact and merciful justice, a reduced penalty, uh, not the full measure of the law, Go and intercept that person and, and make it right with him before it gets to the next step of the courtroom. Get it right, get it right, get it right. So this morning, you know, the person who's been really saved, reconciled to God, will take to heart the four imperatives to leave, to go, to be reconciled, and then to make the proper worship. The person that really wants a relationship with God realizes that that relationship with God also hinges on our relationship to one another. If there's someone that you've said something harshly and unkind and unfair, you have a responsibility. Would you forgive me? Because what you've just done, you have expressed the heart of a murderer. You might have used the word raka or fool or your own choice, your own custom words. But in reality, it's the heart of a murderer. And if you have that towards multiple people, you're a multiple killer. You're a serial killer. Now, obviously, there's consequences that are greater for those who take their thoughts to the next level. I get that. 
with the lowest common denominator between the murderer and this person here, it's the same heart, a heart of anger. May I encourage all of us this morning, if there's someone in our heart we have not forgiven, while you in a moment sit or stand praying, would you forgive them from your heart? They may never ask for your forgiveness. They may never accept your forgiveness. You know, but if, if you need to forgive someone, while you stand praying, Mark says, while you stand praying, Lord, I forgive so-and-so from my heart. Starts there. When you forgive from your heart someone who's offended you, it frees you. It liberates you. You're set free from that bondage. You don't need to be in jail for someone else's crime. Forgive. 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 So is there someone you just need to say, God, yes, they offended me deeply, but I cannot go another moment with anger in an unforgiving spirit. Lord, forgive them for what they have done. And Lord, help me not to hold this against them. May I forgive them as you have forgiven me of so many things. Would you forgive me? Would you do that in a moment? Is there someone that you're angry with without a cause or you've allowed it to just simmer and boil? You know they have something against you or you have something against them. Would you quickly, and please don't line up all at once with me. We can set appointments for the week. But would you quickly make that phone call, send that text and say, hey, can we get together? Can we get together? Would you quickly seek to be reconciled to your brother? Now, if they don't want it, that's their choice. Or if they're not ready for it, they'll have to work for that part. But you go in the right manner in love, seeking to make your apologies. If you have, would you go? I think the reconciled people of God live like this. Is it easy? No. But it's the right thing that righteous people do. Will you do it? Let's bow for prayer. This morning, if heads bowed and eyes closed, who would say this morning, I have had a problem with an angry heart towards someone, maybe even hatred. I hate it. I hate them. Maybe you've said, I wish they would die. I wish I could kill them. Or whatever, whatever. How many would say, Pastor, I think I've had a heart of a murderer, and I'm going to give it over to God today. I'm going to ask him to forgive me for my heart, my heart of a murderer. Would you slip your hand and say, pray for me. I need to do this. You, you, the word of God has hit this on my heart. Would you pray for me today? Would you pray for me today? Thank you. Some others. Thank you. Others, yes. Would you just say, Lord, help me to forgive them? It's interesting when Jesus says, while you stand praying, forgive. That person who offended you may be dead, yet you're forgiving them in your spirit. That person you're forgiving may not be in the same state, yet you forgive them. Forgive them in your spirit. That's where it begins. Forgive them in your heart. Is there someone that you know they're upset with you because you have done something wrong? You, they do have a legitimate ought, something against you, and you know you've offended someone, and you know they're upset with you. Would you quickly make a connection with them and make it right? Would there be someone here who would say, please pray for me. I need to take this step. I need to go. I need to go quickly and get this thing right. I need to be reconciled with someone. Would you pray for me that I would have the courage and the wisdom would it be someone here you'd say, say with uplifted hand, pray for me. I need to take that step. It's a big step. Thank you. Big step. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We start to see a little glimmer of what it means to be more righteous than the Pharisees if we want to be saved. This is impossible. We need your righteousness given to us through the person of Christ. So, Lord, if there's anyone here who needs Christ, may they come to Christ in faith, believing that he died for them, that he was the ultimate Lamb of God. May they transfer their sin in the sense of confessing their sin to a holy God, and may you forgive them. Lord, for anyone holding anger in their heart, oh, Lord, may they take it to you. May they find freedom in the Spirit of God to, to let it go to give it over to him who judges righteously. Oh, Lord, give them victory. Give them wonderful grace. Lord, if we know someone's upset with us, we've, we've offended someone, they may be struggling with anger towards us. Lord, help us go quickly to that person and do all we can to get things right. Lord, may we realize how important relationships are before you. 
may we all realize how important the words we use to communicate to one another are and how you put heavy weights on our speech. So Lord, guard us. May we build one another up and not tear one another down. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.